Hey guys, in this video I'll briefly introduce you to procedural vertex animations. We'll work in the vertex shader and I'll illustrate you the main components that, combined together, can make every cool animation possible. It can be very convenient to learn how to animate meshes directly inside the shader, since it is much more performant than doing that via code, blueprints or through skeletal meshes. The first and simplest movement we can add to a mesh is a translation. It consists in just specifying a direction to move towards and a number of units to the mesh as a whole. Of course, it would be possible to feed in a single vector that contains both of these information, like this. But I often find separating the translation in these two distinct elements increasing the readability of the code. The translation can be used in a less banal way by giving each vertex a different direction of movement. For example, it is possible to inflate or deflate the mesh by passing as direction of translation the vertex normals. It is also possible to uniformly scale the mesh by using as direction the position of the vertices themselves, relatively to the pivot point. By playing on the intensity with some gradient, it is also possible to create a stretch of the mesh along a direction. This video is about animation though. But until now, we just saw still deformations. To give life to what we're doing, we just need to introduce the node time to the function of our intensity. In this context, the trigonometric functions come often very handy to create looping animations. Now we can decide the speed by scaling up or down the time. One more nice example could be taking the absolute value of the sign to get a realistic bouncing motion. The easier way to rotate a mesh via shader in a reel is to use the rotate about axis node. It is built exactly for that purpose such that it outputs directly the warp position offset instead of the transformed position. So, to rotate a mesh we just need to fill the inputs and plug the node in. It's possible to obtain a more complex rotation by concatenating more than one of these nodes. The way to do that is not very straightforward though. Before rotating for the second time the mesh, we need to add the offset to the warp position to have our rotator coordinates. Then the two offsets coming out of the nodes must be added together. An operation slightly more advanced is the stretch or compression with the conservation of the volume. It essentially consists in lengthening one axis while simultaneously and proportionally shortening the other two, so that we deform the object without changing its actual size. 
This is an extremely used technique in animation for making the animated object feel more alive. It can easily be achieved by choosing which axis to stretch and multiplying it by some value, then grabbing the other two and multiplying them by the reciprocal of that same number. Remember to subtract the word position from it and we got our offset. We can animate this by using a function of time as intensity parameter, as usual. Of course, it is possible to execute all these operations at the same time. To do that, most of the time, adding all the offsets together is enough. Let's try it and see what happens. I... will say that's a first version of something. By making an effort of imagination, I can see a cube making a backflip. Let's try to refine the code to achieve that motion. For example, we can already notice that simply adding all the transformations together isn't working for us. When the cube stretches while being rotated, it gets deformed in a weird way. It will make much more sense to rotate the already stretched cube, for example. To properly do that, let's plug the stretched position in the rotation node. We can already see the animation being much more clean. The issue we can immediately notice is that now all the animation components are playing at the same moment, with the same duration. But it shouldn't be like that. We can do some operations on the time node to create a sort of procedural timeline to drive everything. We can consider our animation to start at time 0 and end at time 1. After that value, we can decide to make it loop and start again from zero. To do that, we can just grab the fractional part of the time value. As you can see, now we have our node outputting values from zero to one in loop. In this case, we are setting our animation to be one second long. If we want to change the animation length, we need to divide the time value by the desired number of seconds first. Now our gradient is still going from 0 to 1, but a fifth of the speed. We still have just one value to drive everything though. To decide when each animation component should start and end, we have to create other timelines from the one we just made. It can be done by subtracting the start time and dividing the result by the duration of the animation which can be calculated by subtracting the start time from the end time. This value needs to be kept in 0-1 range. It's a bit hard to understand, but, as you can see, now the gradient animates only in the range defined by the scholars. One thing to notice is that we just created a linear gradient, which means that the speed of the animation will be constant but we could add a smooth step node to the gradient to obtain an easy ease, or a 1- minus node to invert it, for example. Now we have to copy these nodes for every component of the animation we want to drive independently from the others. After some trials and tunings, this is the final animated shader. While animating this way is far more efficient than doing it through skeletal meshes and blueprints, you have to keep in mind that it comes with some flaws. The most noticeable, especially if you create an animation that moves the mesh by a lot from its original position like this one, is that the word position offset doesn't affect the mesh bounds which means that the object will be visible only if its original position is framed in the viewport. In fact, if I move the camera, the cube disappears. It can be fixed by expanding the bounds of the mesh, but it can be a double-edged sword, 
since that mesh may result in view much more often than it actually is, causing it to be rendered unnecessarily. One other flaw, less noticeable, is that these animations don't affect some rendering features, like the motion blur, at least not by default. Another important one is that these vertex offsetting operations don't update the normals of the mesh. You can realize it by remembering that, in this shader, I'm passing as emissive color the vertex normals in workspace. These serve the purpose of making every face of the cube recognizable, but exactly for that reason you can tell that something is off. In fact, as the cube moves and rotates, each face should be changing color accordingly to the new direction it is facing. This issue can be fixed in some cases by applying the same transformations to the normal vectors. If left like this, the mesh, when rotated, will not be properly lit. This video will get you through the basic elements you should know to tackle most of the shader animation problems. There are many areas of application of this stuff in a video game. Let me know what type of animations you would like to see, and they will be discussed in future videos.